first to fly. How Wilbur and Orville Wright invented the airplane. By Peter Busby. Paintings by David Craig. Essential question. How can trial and error lead to new inventions? It's the spring of 1900, and brothers Wilbur and Orville Wright have traded bicycle making for the elusive dream of building a piloted aircraft. They're setting up camp to test their latest glider at Kitty Hawk on a barren, windswept island in North Carolina. It was far from perfect, but the brothers would learn to love it. There were two life-saving stations, a weather bureau, a post office, and about 20 little houses among the sand dunes. But not much else. Wilbur's trip to Kitty Hawk with the glider packed in a crate was an incredible journey by train, ferry, then fishing boat. The last part of Wilbur's trip in a decrepit, flat-bottomed fishing schooner was a nightmare. It started off calm enough, but when they reached the open sea, a storm arose. The cabin was so filthy that Wilbur spent the whole night on deck. Soaked to the skin, shivering cold, and ravenously hungry, with nothing to eat but a jar of jam, Wilbur wondered if he'd ever set foot on land again. Finally, they docked at Kitty Hawk just before dawn. His hosts, the local postmaster, Bill Tate and his wife, greeted him with a splendid breakfast of ham and eggs. Orville arrived two weeks later, bringing supplies of tea and coffee, and they pitched their tent on the sand dunes, close to where they would fly the glider. Their mechanic, Charles Taylor, was left in charge of the bicycle shop back home. We certainly can't complain of the place, Orville wrote to his sister, Catherine. We came down here for wind and sand, and we have got them. Some nights, when the wind came in from the Atlantic, they would have to jump out of their cots and hold the tent to keep it from blowing away, with sand stinging their hands and faces. Wilbur and Orville pitched a tent on the dunes. The brothers started off cautiously, flying the glider as a kite. They simply held it up off the sand and let the wind take it. Then they played out ropes attached to the struts, the parts between the wings. They pulled on other ropes that moved the wing warping, side-to-side -side movement, and elevator, upward and downward movement, controls, practicing keeping the craft level and bringing it safely down to land, learning the skills of a pilot from the ground. Each flight brought the moment closer when Wilbur would take his life in his hands and pilot the glider himself. One day in early October, he was ready. He positioned himself in the cockpit of the glider with his hands on the elevator controls and his feet against the wing warping controls. Orville grasped one wingtip and Bill Tate the other and the two hoisted Wilbur and the glider into the air. Wilbur heard a dry crack as the 25-mile, 40-kilometers-per-hour wind filled the fabric of the wings, and then he felt a sudden weightlessness. Orville and Bill played out the ropes, letting Wilbur soar higher and higher. Wilbur and Orville carry the 1900 glider back to camp. The next few seconds passed in a blur. He'd thought there would be all the time in the world to plan his moves, to look around him, and to experience life from the air. Instead, he found himself functioning on pure instinct as the plane lurched up and down, one moment plunging straight for the ground, the next nosing upward, threatening to stall and fall over on its back. Let me down, he shouted. Orville and Bill pulled on the ropes and brought the glider safely down onto the sand. Wilbur had done it. He had flown but he was not intending to risk it again, not until he understood the plane a lot better. 
for the next two weeks, they went back to testing the craft as a kite, using weights instead of a pilot, noting how it behaved in different wind conditions, and measuring everything, drag, lift, wind speed, and the angle at which the glider kite flew. They even tried turning the glider around with the elevator in the rear. In the final week, Wilbur had the confidence to fly again, and this time he would try free flight without the ropes. Altogether, he made about a dozen glides between 200 feet, 61 meters, and 300 feet, 91 meters in length. On October 23rd, they went home, leaving the glider behind on the dunes. During the winter, it would be destroyed by the savage Atlantic gales, all except for the sateen wing covering. A few days after they left, Mrs. Tate removed the material and made it into dresses for her daughters. Next July, the brothers were back in Kitty Hawk with a new glider, twice as big as the 1900 model. They made camp at the foot of Kill Devil Hills, a group of huge sand dunes, four miles, 6.5 kilometers, to the south of Kitty Hawk. They built a shed for the glider, where they could sleep at night and be sheltered from the punishing weather, either the pounding rain or the scorching sun. With Wilbur at the controls, Bill and Dan Tate let the wind lift the new glider off the top of the dunes. Then there were the mosquitoes. The sand and grass and trees and hills and everything were covered with them, Orville wrote to Catherine. They chewed us right through our underwear and socks. Lumps began swelling all over my body like hen's eggs. They tried everything to protect themselves, blankets, netting, and finally smoking the mosquitoes out by burning old tree stumps. At first, the glider performed poorly, but after making adjustments to the elevator and the camber, the upward curve from the front to the rear of the wings, the brothers started doing better. Their friend, Octave Chanute, was present for their best glide, 390 feet, 119 meters in 17 seconds. He was impressed, but the brothers were dissatisfied. The glider's lift was not much better than last year, and the controls seemed worse. On August 9th, when Wilbur tried to turn the glider, he crashed nose first into the ground, banging his head against a wooden strut. The accident was not serious, but it added to the brothers' frustration, and they left Kitty Hawk earlier than planned. On the train home, Orville said what both of them were feeling. Not within a thousand years will man ever fly. The brothers did not stay depressed for long. Instead, they decided to go back to the beginning and think through everything they had done. If size alone hadn't improved their performance, then maybe the secret was the shape of the glider and the wings. To research this, they built a wind tunnel in the workshop. For the next few months, there would be no camping on the dunes and gliding in the open air. Instead, they were indoors, testing almost 200 wing shapes. Every day they made new discoveries about how the wings of a plane behave in the air. At the end of their research, they had the design of a new glider that was very different from the ones they had made before. Analyze the text. Text structure. How does the author organize the text on pages 646 through 647? What clues in the text show this? In the first three days back at Kitty Hawk, they made more than 50 flights in the 1902 glider. Already they were staying in the air longer than they had before. Orville had begun to fly a little in the previous year, and now he was making half the flights. One day, as he took the plane higher, the glider nosed upward at a dangerous angle. Orville pushed on the elevator, struggling to get the plane level again. 
To his horror, he found himself slipping backward, tail first toward the ground. There was a crash of splintering timber as the tail pounded into the sand. Orville stepped out of the glider without a scratch. The tail could soon be mended, but it was obvious that there was something wrong with its design. The 1902 glider was their first one to have a tail, which was fixed in a vertical position. The tail was supposed to give the plane more control, but Orville felt it wasn't doing that. He had an idea. What if they put a hinge on the tail so that the pilot could move it at the same time as he warped the wings to make a turn? Orville suggested this to Wilbur, then waited for his brother's reaction. He expected an argument because that was the way the brothers worked out their ideas. Both boys had tempers, Charles Taylor later recalled. They would shout at one another something terrible. I don't think they really got mad, but they sure got awfully hot. Instead, on this occasion, Wilbur said nothing for a while, then told Orville he agreed about hinging the rudder, but he had a better idea. Instead of having a separate control, they should connect the wing warping controls and the rudder, so the pilot could use the hip cradle to move both at the same time. That's what they did, and it worked perfectly. They started doing longer glides, and the control problem was solved. That year, the Wright brothers made almost a thousand flights. On their final day of gliding, they broke their record again with a glide of 622 feet, 190 meters, lasting 26 seconds. Wilbur and Orville went home happy. They had achieved their first goal, designing a glider that could be controlled in the air. Now they were ready to build a plane with an engine and propellers. Analyze the text. Conclusions, generalizations. What generalizations can be made about the Wright brothers based on the text evidence on pages 648 through 649? The 1902 glider was their first one with a fixed tail. After problems during early trials, Orville suggested a movable tail, or rudder. With a rudder, they could keep the glider pointed in the proper direction as they rolled into a turn. Twelve magic seconds. On the morning of December 17, 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright stepped out of their shack and looked around them. Ice had formed in puddles between the sand dunes from the heavy rain overnight, but the sky was now clear. The weather was almost perfect, except for the wind. The winds were stiff today, thirty knots. The brothers were cautious men. Any other day they would have waited for calmer conditions, but they had lost enough time already in the two months they'd spent at Kitty Hawk. There had been problems tuning the engine, making it run smoothly, and cranking up the power. And twice they had had to send the propeller shafts back to Dayton for repairs. Soon it would be winter, the weather would be too harsh, and they'd have to get back to the bicycle shop. They decided to risk it. Today was the day they were going to attempt to fly their plane. Orville hoisted a large red flag on the roof of the shack. The flag was a signal to the men of the Kill Devil Life Saving Station, a mile, 1.6 kilometers away, to come and lend a hand. The over 700 pound, 318 kilograms flyer was too heavy for two men to carry by themselves. And the brothers had another reason for inviting people to join them. If the world was going to believe them, they had to have witnesses. A short distance from the house, Wilbur and Orville started laying a line of wooden beams. The machine would move along this track until the propellers pushed the wings through the air fast enough to lift the plane off the ground. By the time they'd finished, the life-saving crew had arrived. 
Once the flyer was in position, Wilbur and Orville took hold of the blades of the two propellers and pulled hard to give them a spin. The engine sputtered and coughed into life. Analyze the text. Personification. The author uses the phrase, coughed into life, on this page. What does the phrase mean? Why does the author use personification here? Wilbur took aside one of the lifesavers, John Daniels, and showed him the camera placed on a tripod near the ramp. There was a cord attached to it with a rubber ball at the end. When the flyer leaves the ground, Wilbur explained, you squeeze this ball. Daniels looked worried. He had never used a camera before. The two brothers walked away from the others for a quiet moment. They had spent five years on this project, designing a series of gliders, learning how to control them in the air, and finally, because no one else could make an engine light enough and powerful enough, they had built one themselves in the bicycle workshop. They had made their first attempt with the Wright Flyer three days earlier, on December 14th. The track was laid down the side of a hill, then the brothers tossed a coin to decide who would be the pilot. Wilbur won. He climbed into the plane. The flyer rattled down the ramp and lifted off. Wilbur was in the air, but soon he was in trouble. He rose no higher than 15 feet, 4.6 meters, then lost height, landing awkwardly with the left wing plowing into the sand. Some might call this a flight, but not the rights. A flight for them had to be controlled. The flyer was soon repaired. It was a mistake, the brothers decided, to take off going downhill. Today they had laid the track on a flat piece of sand. Wilbur and Orville start their engine by spinning the blades of the two propellers. Now it was Orville's turn to be the pilot. He climbed into the hip cradle on the bottom wing and lay flat on his stomach, settling his hips into the cradle that controlled the wing warping and rudder, and grasping the lever that controlled the elevator. Orville's going to be nervous, Wilbur said to the men watching. Let's try and cheer him on. Holler and clap. He turned back to his brother, and they clasped hands, as if, one of the lifesavers said later, they weren't sure they'd ever see each other again. Wilbur took his place at the wingtip as his brother released the wire holding the straining plane in place. The propellers began to move the plane faster and faster along the track. Wilbur was running next to him, shouting encouragement, ready to let go of the wing. Then, 40 feet, 12 meters down the track, the flyer lifted into the air. Wilbur clicked on his stopwatch. Orville pulled up on the elevator. The flyer started up at a dangerous angle, about to stall and fall back on its tail. Orville reacted. At Kill Devil Hills, at 10.35 a.m., December 17, 1903, Orville takes off on the first-ever manned and powered flight. Wilbur, who steadied the plane while it moved down the launching rail, is still half-running. This famous photograph was taken with Orville's camera by John Daniels, one of the life-saving station crew. Throwing the elevator lever down. Now the flyer was heading for the ground. Another touch on the elevator pulled the plane up again, then down, and the flyer pancaked into the ground. It was a hard landing, but both the plane and the pilot were in one piece. Wilbur stopped his watch. The flyer had been in the air for 12 seconds. He turned to John Daniels. Did you get it? He had. His picture of the flyer, three feet, point nine meters off the ground, with Orville on board and Wilbur running beside him, is one of the most famous photographs ever taken. Orville had flown 120 feet, 36.5 meters. Both of them thought they could do better. 
At 11.20 a.m., Wilbur made a flight of 175 feet, 53 meters. Then it was Orville's turn again. He managed 200 feet, 61 meters. At noon, Wilbur climbed into the pilot's cradle. For the first 300 feet, 91 meters, it was like the other flights, with the plane bouncing up and down. Then Wilbur managed to keep it level for another 500 feet, 152 meters, until a sudden gust of wind caught it, sending it diving toward the ground. Wilbur stepped out of the cradle, unhurt. He had flown for 59 seconds, traveling 852 feet, 260 meters.